Okay, let's dive in. Um, <coughs> the slides for this talk are available on GitHub. That's the link where you can find them. I've also tweeted them, so you should be able to spot them fairly easily, so you don't need to worry about following along. What I'm going to be talking about is uh, how do you get data to be processed faster, and specifically in a certain context. See, last year we were working with uh, CNN and Microsoft on the coverage of the elections. And the things that we were trying to answer were, can we see what the history of elections looked like? And that requires scraping data from the elections website. So the kind of, for, to give you a sense of the kind of stuff that we were trying to tackle. Um, and this was one of the scenarios. In one of the states, who, how many candidates were actually standing for election at any point in time, and how did that change over time? So each of these circles is one constituency, and the size of the circle represents the number of candidates that stood for election. So in this constituency, there were seven candidates in 1967. In this one, there were five candidates. In this one, there were three candidates, and so on. You could play along across the years and see in, across, you know, over time, how did this change? The color of the uh, circles represent the party that actually won. And, there's a whole bunch of parties out there. Uh, strange things come out of uh, explorations like this. So for, uh, for instance, this constituency had as many as 90 candidates standing for elections. So uh, at this point, it's no longer a small ballot sheet that you have to fill. It's more like a ballot booklet that you have to flip through right, to find the right candidate. Uh, and in 1989, there's a sudden spurt of participation. Uh, so why did that happen? But uh, this is bizarre. Now, uh, in 1991, there were 264 candidates and 249 candidates standing respectively in elections for a certain constituency. And if you look at this list, now it, it, it's not even a sheet. Now it, it's more like a booklet that you have to flip through. Um, but all of this pales in comparison with the 96 elections when as many as 1,033 candidates stood for elections in just one single constituency. Right? Uh, and if you look at the names, uh, it, it, it gets a little worrying. I mean, for instance, you have Palnisami S, Palnisami S, Palnisami S, Palnisami S. I mean, how do you even figure out which Palnisami S you're voting for, right? Which probably seems to have been a bit of a confusion because there were as many as 88 candidates who got exactly zero votes, meaning they didn't even vote for themselves. Either they couldn't find themselves on the ballot sheet or the election commission got confused as to who exactly they were that you know, it went all over the place. Uh, we finally found out what happened uh, in this particular election. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, there was a farmer's protest and the fee or deposit for uh, getting into the elections was just 500 rupees, which is what in today's terms about $10. So there were these farmers who stood outside the election commission uh, office and handed out 500 rupees to anyone who walked by and said, go register yourself. Their aim was to get to 5,000 people. They only managed to get 1,000. But the thing is, it's great to be able to detect stuff like this. But in order to be able to get there, one needs to get the raw data. And the good part is the data is available. The trouble is it's in the form of PDF files. So we spent a fair bit of time converting those PDFs into uh, a CSV file. And that was done mostly in Python as well. But this talk is not about that. It's about having gotten to that point, which is so out here. I have, for example, an, uh, a, a, a CSV file that has the assembly election results. And you know this is what it looks like. I have the state. I have the year, the assembly constituency, number and name, the name of the candidate, the gender, the age, the category, and so on, and the total number of uh, votes that they got for their party. Right um, <clears throat> now. Let's ask the question, who got the most votes? In fact, this is a standard interview question at uh, Graham, the firm that I work with. And this is a fairly typical result. In fact, I've literally taken lines of code from the most common solutions and put it in here. So the solution goes roughly like this. Uh, is, is this visible from the back? Let me know if you need, to, need me to make it bigger. Uh, so you start with an empty array and initialize the row count to zero. You loop through each of the lines in the file, increment the row count. If the row count is greater than one, basically you're skipping the header, then you parse the row by splitting it using commas. Now that's a naive way of parsing, but most of the solutions, that's what they do. And in this particular case, uh, in this file, it's safe. None of the names, none of the parties, none of the assembly constituencies have commas in them. Uh, and if the fourth value happens to be Bangalore South, so the, the question is, tell me uh, who got the most votes in a given constituency. So let's say Bangalore South. So if the, the constituency matches what you're looking for, then take the name from the sixth column, uh, well, seventh actually, uh, and get the votes from the appropriate column, which in this case is CSV row of 11. 
uh, append it to a list, and then finally use uh, operator and do a sorted on operator dot item getter of one, which is I mean, uh, a fairly standard piece of code that first filters all of the matches that you want and then runs a sort operation to sort it in descending order. And these are the results that it comes out with. Right Now, let's see how long this takes. <coughs> the thing is, before one gets into optimization, the first step is obviously trying to see how fast the program runs. And in this particular scenario, it takes about 376 milliseconds per loop. The data is not large. It's about um, a <coughs> few hundreds of megabytes. It's, it's absolutely not large. Uh, but the thing is, this has to be processed extremely fast in real time, in the sense that the data is streaming in. So we need to be able to serve this query to millions of users. And in fact, it turned out to be 10 million users at peak on that day, so on the day of uh, the election results being announced. And this has to be done with as low a latency as possible. You can't afford to cache this. So ideally, you want this in real time. And if you do have a delay, a delay of more than one second is unacceptable. This was being streamed on television. Uh, so for a single query to take 376 milliseconds is absolutely ridiculous. So let's see if, it's, if we need to make it fast enough. Right? Now, um, before we dive in, let me quote, uh, well, firstly, let me quote Calvin, who uh, does this when he looks at his homework. Right? So when I... Uh, uh, problems often look overwhelming at first, and the secret is to break problems into smaller, manageable chunks. So you deal with those, and you're done before you know it. For example, I'm supposed to read this entire history chapter. It looks impossible, so I break it down in Hobbes asks. So you focus on reading the first section? No. I ask myself, do I even care? You actually need to ask yourself, do you even care? Do you really want to make this fast, or are you just wasting time? Right? In this particular case, we did care. We needed to, but it's surprising how often I see people saying, oh, we've got to make this go faster. And the answer to the question, why do you need it to go faster, is because, because it's there, right? because I can do it. Think about it. And I'll talk a little more about uh, what exactly one needs to optimize. But let's start with finding the slowest path. Really, that's what you need to optimize. And uh, a really useful module for that is line profiler. Uh, and that tells you which line goes fast or slow. And you just do a pip install line profiler. I've uh, done a small tweak to IPython notebook so that I actually get the results uh, as an output directly. Otherwise, it comes up at the bottom pane. But otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. So if you use the command lp run on the function that we just created, it gives the following output. It says, for each line, given the line number, the number of times that line is executed, which is the hits, the total time spent in executing it, what is therefore the time per hit? and the percentage of time that's spent against each of these lines. The percentage of time column is the one that I consider the most useful. And out here, 30% of the time is being spent in splitting the row. About 15% is spent in comparing whether the row is greater than 1. About 16% is spent in incrementing the row. 18% is spent in checking if the assembly constituency name matches and so on. So I know that I do not have to worry about these three lines. I don't even have to look at them. I don't have to look at these two lines. It narrows the problem space down to what I need to optimize, and it gives me a sense of in what order I need to optimize as well. Which brings me to my three top rules for optimizing. Basically, it's about picking your battle. If you find something that's obviously redundant, get rid of it. That's free money. If you find something that is not so obviously redundant, then you've got two approaches. One, you can reduce the number of times that line is executed, or you can make the function go faster. Quite often, the former is easier. The latter is what considered true optimization. But you usually get better results if you just do less work. Just don't call that line out. Make sure that the line that doesn't get executed each time. Let me walk you through in the, the previous piece of code examples of how you do each of these. Let's take the obviously redundant. Right? Now, we've got this check if rho is greater than 1. Uh, we're going through this every time and checking if we are not in the first row. Really, that check needs to happen only once. Right at the beginning, what you could do is open the file and then skip the first line. And thereafter, there's no question of what the row, row number is. Who cares what the row number is? We're just passing this data as it is. Now, if you, are, if you time this, turns out that the earlier one took 378 milliseconds. This takes 364 milliseconds. So that's about 2.5% faster. Not much, but that's 2.5% of free money. So you just take it. It doesn't cost much. Now. 
On this new code, what takes the bulk of the time? Let's look at the percentages. 45% is going into splitting the line. How does one optimize that? Now, line splitting is a pretty fast function, right? One approach is to say, let me reduce the number of times the line is going to be split. Now, we are searching for the results for a particular constituency. Now, the file has 300 odd thousand, almost uh, 400,000 rows. Now, we, are, we really only need to split the line for the lines that match that particular constituency. Why are we bothering splitting it for every single line? Right? Now, if we, can ext if we can do the filtering first, get to the lines that match this particular constituency, and then do the splitting, that works. And fortunately, the names of the constituencies don't overlap with anything else. So the names of the people are very different from the names of the constituencies. And barring some extreme examples, uh, <coughs> you can by and large just search for the presence of a word in a line. So you can rewrite this to say, instead of doing the splitting outside the, I mean, uh, outside the conditional, you can say, if the line matches the assembly name, I don't care about whether it matches it as part of the candidate's name or as part of the constituency name or whatever. But if I find this particular constituency name anywhere on the line, then and only then do I bother splitting it. Right? Now, what does that do to the code? That makes it about 63% faster. That's a pretty solid improvement. So what we've done here is not as much made it go faster as much as just made it do less work. But okay, now where is the time going into? So there's about 45% going into the for loop itself. And there's 53% going into checking if this particular candidate's name is present in the line. How do we optimize that? Now the thing is, something like if line.find of something is that it's, it's small enough that it's tough to optimize, right? So you've got to go a little deeper. So let's take a module called disassemble. Now what disassemble does is effectively gives you the byte code. So I'm going to define this function, def check, which takes two parameters, line and AC name. And inside this, we're going to use the same piece of code that we saw in the previous slide, do a find. Now the disassemble module gives us the byte code. And what it's doing here is loading line loading find and loading assembly constituency name. So it gets all of those into the working memory and then calls a certain function which loads a constant which is zero and runs a compare operation and then returns a value. So that's a reasonably large number of things to do when you're you know, executing something like find, right? What if instead we took something like AC name in line? That's replacing a function with an operator that does pretty much the same thing. Now the bytecode for this is load fast AC name, load fast line, do a compare op, and then return the value. That seems to be doing a lot less. But none of this is any indication of whether it will really work. You've got to try it out. So let's try it out. By replacing dot find a function with an operator, the code runs 63% faster than the 63% that we got earlier. So that's an extra 63% now. So if you summarize the results so far, the original version took about 380 milliseconds. We removed a redundant line and got a 2.5% improvement. Then we got a 63% uh, uh, improvement by uh, calling, the fun calling a line or executing a line fewer times. And we got a further 63% improvement by using switching to an operator instead of a function. And that makes it run about 171% you know, faster, which is what about two and a half times eventually, right? Give or take. So <clears throat> the thing is, look, I uh, when it comes to optimization, we normally say there's bound to be some library for that. Right? And in this case, you would have said, yeah, just use pandas. That's that's blazing fast for data operations, right? Or go to NumPy. Uh, let's try that out. Now this is code that does exactly the same thing that our previous function does. It takes the assembly constituency name, it reads the CSV file, and then returns the data. Let's go through this step by step. So it takes the assembly constituency name, and where the string contains the assembly constituency name, it returns that as a subset. In other words, this phrase does the filtering. And then you're sorting in descending order. Oops, let me do that. Uh, then you're sorting in descending order of the votes, and all of this is being done with C in the back end. But this, in fact, runs 91% slower than our previous piece of code. 
And the reason for this is not because Pandas is slow, but because it's being executed in a naive way. Now, the two, op the two optimizations that we did are fairly extreme ones. We said, don't bother checking for the assembly constituency name in this particular column. In fact, don't even bother trying to split the file into columns. Just treat the lines as is and do a comparison. And secondly, we're using an operator instead of a function, whereas Pandas internally is not doing that. It's str.contains, which in fact checks for regular expressions. right? So if you actually want something to go faster and you go the library route, you might end up with something that seems kind of OK, but you would A, struggle with optimizing that because you can't quite take the, the C code as easily as you would the Python code and optimize that. And secondly, you would most likely miss out the details of what exactly is is happening inside. You can't do an LP run on this. You can't run line profiler in, 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 on a, an optimized C code and try and figure out where exactly it's taking the bulk of the time. So sometimes it's actually better to do the bulk of your development in Python before you dive in into hyper-optimized functions. And I will come to how we do this a bit later. Uh, but while we're on this topic, see, uh, we have chosen to store these files as CSV files, but is there a faster file format? I mean, what if we chose JSON instead, or XML, or Pickle, or whatever? Let's see how long each of these takes. This is just an aside. Uh, so here's a quick check. If you were looking at CSVs and reading them using DictReader, that for the data set that I picked, takes about seven seconds. Pickle's a bit faster, about five and a half seconds. JSON is as bad as uh, <laughs> DictReader. Uh, if you load it when it's stored as an array of dicts, it's a lot faster when you treat it as an array of arrays. That's partly due to the overhead of the creation of dicts. Uh, and also, the size of the file increases when you treat it as an array of dictionaries. CSV reader is reasonably fast. Um, it's about you know six times faster than DictReader. So from a performance perspective, you probably do want to go for it. And again, the reason is that dicts are pretty slow. Pandas does the same thing, uh, much faster. It's faster than even CSV Reader. And here you, you do get the benefits of having it in a dict-like structure without the overhead of having to create dicts. Um, but Pandas, when reading pickle, isn't that much faster than read pickle. So it's, it's specifically the read CSV function that's heavily optimized. But if there's a format that you really want to go in for, uh, for storing structured data, it's probably HDF5. Um, supported by Pandas, supported by a variety of other platforms, pretty neutral, built for speed, built for storage across distributed systems. And by and large, we've tried to move towards HDF5 when the data doesn't have to be read by a human or a system like Excel or OpenOffice or whatever. Uh, so yeah, by and large, uh, go for HDF5 as a format. And do keep in mind that the best optimizer is in your head. It's not a library. Um, I'm going to switch over to a slightly different topic, but keeping the same theme in mind, which is how do I go about optimizing scraping? Now, the reason we had to do this was because all of this data was in PDF files, and we had to get all of these one by one, convert the PDF, and so on. Uh, so it, it was effectively a, scraping, a PDF scraping problem. Uh, but the thing is here that the, it's not the computations that are the bottleneck. It's not even that the network is slow. Uh, the number of PDF files where you know, it's like, tens of thousands. It, it wasn't massive, and the network was reasonably fast. It, the problem really was that the connections would break, and you would have to recreate that environment. So ideally, you don't want to have to restart the scraping from scratch. So you do the obvious thing, which is you make your programs restartable. right? So uh, when you take a list of URLs, what you want to do is parse that URL and convert that into a tree, tree structure. The parsing isn't slow. Uh, the fetching of the results. How do we get out of this? Okay. Uh, the parsing isn't slow. The conversion isn't slow. Uh, it's the fetching of the results that really is slow. So is there a way we can cache operations transparently? Now, we've seen enough examples of this even in this particular session. So one way is to cre replace the, the, the loading function, the URL function, with something like this. When I say get of URL, it picks a file name, some random file name. And if that file name does not exist, then does a URL retrieve into that file, and then opens it. So whenever I execute this the first time, it takes a reasonable amount of time. So that's taken 9.2 nine nine, 9 seconds. But the second time, the same function is executed. That takes a few nanoseconds. And that's obvious, because you've just cached it, right? So caching as a pattern is clearly a, a big win. Um, <coughs> The thing, though, is how do I get to save this as a unique key? What kinds of keys work on URLs? 
Now, several options exist. You have hashlib, which, uh, well, firstly, one possibility is that the URL is the file name itself. And that, that's a pretty simple and useful mapping because I'm scraping a thousand files. The name of each of those files is what I've saved as a file name. It becomes very easy mentally to map it. And if it's possible, I would strongly suggest going with it. But sometimes you want to store the paths themselves. And the paths are not always amenable to your file system. So some of them have colons and stuff like that. So you could say, I will just remove the special characters from the URL. Uh, unfortunately, that may mean that you would be caching different URLs into the same file name. So if I had qu query x equals 1, that's different from slash x slash 1, and they would be mapping to the same file. So instead, you could go for the next best option, which is a hashing function. The trouble with hashing functions is that the inverse is not humanly obvious. I can't look at a hash and say, this is the file that it corresponded to. So the reverse mapping for a human is tough. But from a system perspective, it works great. And if you're looking at massive scale data, then that's pretty much the only way to do it. Question is, how does one hash efficiently? Right Now, Hashlib has a bunch of algorithms. What are their speeds? Um, <clears throat> MD5 takes about one and a half seconds to run through. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure how many. This is uh, it's doing a time at, well, for however long. Uh, MD5 takes 1.5 seconds. SHA1 is a bit slower. SHA224 is a bit slower, and so on. SHA512 is the slowest, and it takes about twice as much time as an MD5. So you'd say, yeah, uh, so I should probably go in for MD5, because as long as the likelihood of collision is small, I mean, we're not going to be scraping so many files that MD5 itself runs out of, I mean, gets into a collision space. So MD5 is probably what I should be going to. But is there something uh, faster than this? Well, what about the built-in hash function? So hash of any object returns a unique number. And this is something that I could use. And it's significantly faster than MD5, right? In fact, it's about uh, almost 10 times or 8 times faster than MD5. This whole thing took, takes only 0.196 seconds. So I did this. And this is one of those cases where premature optimization came to haunt me. There are two problems here. Firstly, MD5, I mean, how long does that take? How many times are you going to do it? You have, what, a million files? A million MD5s probably took a, you know, one and a half seconds. Loading that takes one and a half weeks from the network. Right. So what am I optimizing for? And why did this come back to haunt me? Because hash does not return a unique result across platforms. You run the same piece of code on system A, share the hard disk with system B. This one runs Python 2.7.1, and that one runs Python 2.7.4. The hash function is different. And Python 3, yes, even more different if there is such a concept. So this is one of those cases where, but see, the thing is, any optimization that you do breaks your code. You've got to retest. You've got to make sure that it's still functioning fine. All your refactoring does require a good test suite. So when you're optimizing something, you do want to ask yourself, is it worth it? Am I doing it for a benefit that will justify the cost of that retesting on a variety of different reasons? Right. So that was yet another side into when not to optimize. Uh, but getting back to the theme of optimization itself uh, and specifically around caching, let's take date parsing. Now, one of the things that we had to do on the same data set was to take the various dates on which the results were declared and parse them. And date parsing was one slice that was one of the slowest chunks. So uh, for example, here's a sample piece of code that generates date formats in uh, and I, uh, dates in various different formats. So you could have it as year, month, date, day, month, year, day, month, year, day, month, year, day, month, except month spelled alphabetically, and so on. So all of these were actually valid formats that we saw in the various files that we scraped because we were pulling it across different years. And these had to get passed. Fortunately, uh, <laughs> DateUtil is a pretty good library when dealing with flexible formats. So all you have to do is go through, uh, import parse from dateutil.parser go through each line and parse that particular line. And in India, it's the day first format. So by default, date util uses a month first format, which is the American convention. So you just have to account for that. And having accounted for that, it's a reasonably straightforward process. The trouble is, for this sample data set, it takes about eight seconds. Now, question to you. In this piece of code, where do you think the bulk of the 8.1 seconds goes? <coughs> strip. strip, okay. 
up and pass. Yeah, those are probably the three candidates anyway, right? Okay, how many votes for strip? One, two, okay, few. How many? Okay, that's a reasonable number. How many votes for append? Okay, that's a slightly smaller number. How many votes for parse? Okay, so if this were roughly how the you know uh, time was spent in proportion to the number of votes, parse would probably be about forty percent, strip would probably be about thirty percent, append would be about twenty percent, or something, and the rest would be you know. Let's find out, and that's the beautiful thing about being able to parse the lines. Ninety-nine point five percent of the time is going into parse, which is pretty much all of it. That's so much slower than the rest of it that you don't even have to worry about any other line right and once you get this and w once you've solved this problem somehow the code is going to go dramatically faster so when you see code like this you should get excited because you know that if you've cracked one problem then that's it you're set so how do we crack this problem now here the thing is it's one opaque function you can't get into parse so you've got to figure out ways of getting around it now if you go through our checklist of three things, right? Can, is there anything that is obviously redundant in the previous code? Well, even if there is, it doesn't matter. There's only one thing that I've got to do. So now, can I actually optimize the contents of parse? Probably not, probably yes, let's see. That's one direction to go in. Can I reduce the number of times that I call parse? Perhaps, that's another direction to explore in. So let's see what other options we have, right? So if I want to uh, <coughs> instead use Pandas's two date time, and I'm going to take this series, which uh, I've created about 100,000 copies of, and apply two date time. That takes 7.57 seconds. Internally, two date time uses dateutil.parser. So I've got a base test case to say that's what I need to optimize. Now, <coughs> the native uh, dateutil parser on the same data set isn't any faster, uh, in, in, oh, sorry, isn't much faster, slightly faster, but that doesn't help us too much. What if we used strip time? So assuming we already know the format. Now remember, in our original problem, we don't know the format. There are multiple formats. But if we did know the problem, if sorry, if we did know the format, is it any faster? Turns out that it takes only about one and a half seconds. So that's about four times faster than we had before. So knowing the format definitely helps. What if instead of using strip time, we used a manual parsing method? What if the format was actually parsable as integers? So I could say, you know, take the sixth to the tenth character, the first to the second character, the third to the fifth character, convert them into integers, and then parse it. Now that's much faster. That's about eight times faster than the previous one. So if the format is in integers and you parse it in this way, you can get a substantial improvement. But that is not the kind of data that we have. In fact, the, uh, the next year, the date format could change even further. So I do need something as flexible as dateutil.parse to do it. So where we've gotten to is we can make parse faster, but only under a restricted set of scenarios. So we've got to try the other approach, which is can we reduce the number of calls to dateutil.parse, right? So we can cache it. Now the thing about dates is that if you've got a million rows, it's unlikely that you've got a million dates. A million unique dates goes back several, I don't know, centuries, millennia in the past, probably. Right? Uh, a year has 365 days, so three years is about a thousand rows. So a million rows is 3,000 years. So yeah, unless you covered every day for the last 3,000 years, you probably would have some duplicates, which means that you can afford to cache it. And we were covering, what, 50 years, 60 years. So that's easy. All you have to do is convert the data set into a set and loop through each date and then parse it and you've got a dictionary now, and apply that dictionary to each of the data sets. Now, that gets it down from 7 seconds to 9.5 milliseconds, just by calling it fewer times. Right? And there's no loss of flexibility in this one. Now, what about loops? Now, <clears throat> one thing you may have noticed is that in as the code progressed, we've switched from using functions to things like list comprehensions and so on. Uh, thing is, Functions and loops are slow in Python. If you find an opportunity to avoid them, do avoid them. Uh, firstly, if you find a need to optimize, then if you're using functions and loops, then avoid them. If you don't find a need to optimize them, don't optimize in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> so let me show you how this works. Let's take this particular scenario. I've got a random data set, and there is a function which is called square, which just 
takes a value and returns the square of the value. And there's a function called square all, which takes a, a data set, an array, and loops through each value in the array and squares it, puts it back into a result uh, list and returns a result. So now I'm going to call this function uh, square all of data. That takes 25 milliseconds for this 100,000 data set. Not much, but this is just an illustration. Okay. Supposing we inline this function. So earlier, if you noticed, we were calling the function square of value inside square all. What if instead of calling this function, we just took the contents of this function and pasted it in here, effectively using an inline operation as opposed to a function? That's the only change that this does. We have square all two, which takes value times value. And that is about 62% faster. Okay. What if instead of, uh, <laughs> so, okay, and we also have a temporary variable here, squared, right? And then we are doing a result dot append of squared. So instead I could just take this value times value and move it into squared. And that gives us a 9.5% improvement, which isn't a big deal, but we're just saving some, you know, we're saving one opcode, two opcodes. So, but that's a free improvement again. What if we replace the entire function with a list comprehension? So that function simply becomes a value times value for value in data, right, which is all it really did. Right? That makes it 100% faster, twice as fast again. Inlining, fun function calls are slow. Loops are slow. Function calls can be replaced by inlining, and loops can be replaced by list comprehensions. Both of them make a substantial difference to the speed. Um, <clears throat> the last topic that I'm going to cover, I'm going to go through really fast because I've got five minutes. Uh, I did touch upon the difficulty of operating with uh, C optimizations, libraries written in C. Right? You don't need to, however, worry about writing those libraries in C. Uh, between Cython and Numba, you can do the writing in Python and translate that into C. So for example, let's take, uh, I'm going to take a specific example, which is how do I count the number of uh, values in an array between A and B? Right. That's a fairly simple problem to state, and it's also a computationally difficult problem. Now, if I do it the naive way, which is loop through every value and say, tell me if x is within A and B. If so, I'll increment the count by 1 and then return the final count. That takes 210 milliseconds on this relatively small data set. Um, but if we did the same thing uh, using something like a list comprehension and summing it up, that's about 6,600, 6, okay, 66 times faster, which is a huge improvement. Right? So inlining and list comprehensions, that helps for sure. Um, <laughs> But, oh, sorry, no, no, sorry, this is, uh, I, I skipped an example. No, this is where values are stored as a NumPy array. And the thing about a NumPy array is that you can do an entire comparison like this on the full data set, and that's getting executed in C without the overhead of a for loop, without the overhead of any functions. And this is what makes things go faster. So if you've got an array, and it's not in NumPy or any of the modern NumPy equivalents, then you're probably doing something wrong. They should be in a NumPy array or a Pandas array, and that's the order of magnitude of improvement that you get. But you can get it go even faster. See, the thing here is that there is a function called search sorted. Now, what we are doing right now is going through each of these values and checking if the value is greater than or less than. But if values were sorted, pre-sorted, then it's so much faster to identify where exactly the cutoff is for A and where exactly the cutoff is for B. And you're just doing an indexing operation. Remember, sorting in a search, uh, searching in a sorted array is a login operation if you're doing binary search. And in fact, there's a jump search which is even faster and has a, you know, best, a good case complexity of log log n. So if you've managed to pre-sort it, then the code becomes 900 times faster which is not something that a library will give you. That still means that your brain is the best optimizer. But having said that, using code in C is a huge benefit. Now, how can you get there? One option is Cython. So on IPython notebook, for instance, you can use the so-called Cython magic. You just say person person Cython, and you define your function as you normally would in Python, except that you put in a, def de a type definition. In this case, you're saying that this is going to be an int, and this is going to be an int. So that is identical to the code that's below, which is in Python. These are the only two changes. 
And this Cython function, when you benchmark it against the Python function, runs about a thousand, oh sorry, a hundred times faster. So that's free optimization. Right? Now, this is a relatively simple case though. If we tried it, not on this totaling function, but on the, cert, the counting the values between A and B function, then the number of, you know, I'm not going to go through the code, uh, it's only about three times as fast. So sometimes you get a huge benefit, sometimes you get a moderate benefit, but you always, almost always get a benefit unless the function is extremely trivial and you can always benchmark it. But there is an alternative to Cython, which is number, and number is even simpler to use. You just say from number dot decorate decorators import JIT, which is a just in time compiler, and use that as a decorator. And then when you run it, this is the original function takes six milliseconds. The Cython version takes 62 microseconds. The, the number version takes 265 nanoseconds, milli, micro, and nano. Okay, so you are getting a hundred times improvement over this. But again, number is not always this fast, but usually it's faster than Cython. So the, the counting for counting the values between a range A and B that uh, in Python takes 205 milliseconds, in Cython as we saw earlier takes about 84 milliseconds, and in number takes 7, 76, 764 micro, sorry, no, nanoseconds. So blazing fast, in this case you get a solid improvement. Um, I haven't seen a case where number is slower than Cython, therefore I've consistently shifted over to uh, number. So to summarize, if you've got code that's running slow, optimize it. But more importantly, if you don't have code that's running slow, do not optimize it. Okay. First, find the slowest step. You don't want to be optimizing the steps that are running fast enough anyway. The easiest way to reduce or optimize code is reduce the number of times that you're hitting it. Perform the op operation as rarely as possible, and caching is one instance or one technique that applies to this. Uh, <clears throat> If that fails or if that's exhausted, then make your slowest function faster. And there are many ways of doing it. So Python functions, avoid them. Use inline operations if you can. List operations, use them in, in place of loops if you can. And if these fail, then go for number or Cython, which are slightly more tougher to debug, slightly more difficult to implement. But they do exist as a relatively quick and easy way of optimizing it. But most importantly, the second best improvement that you can ever have is by changing the algorithm. Your brain is a better optimizer than any of these. I say second best because the best improvement is by eliminating that code completely. There's nothing quite as good as not having code. And code, remember code is a liability. Functionality is the asset. If you can somehow deliver it without having to write a line of code, that's the best thing. Um, I must say that I haven't touched upon one particular topic consciously, which is parallel processing. Uh, <coughs> and the, I, I do often get questions on what's your view on distributed computing, etc. Short answer, Python's probably not the best place to do that. I just use Unix command line. Uh, run multiple Python processes and just move it outside the domain of Python. That's usually a pretty effective way to scale across multiple systems as well. Uh, the talk, the slides, they're all on GitHub on the URL that I shared with right on top. Hope you found that useful. And I'm sure we don't have time for questions. We have five minutes. So. <coughs> Give it some time to go. Uh, is there any lunch now? So if you have any questions, you can just approach. Yeah, catch me. Uh, catch me at lunch.